Greetings from Parker Guitars. My name is John Page, and today we're going to be taking you through the feature benefit set of the Fly Guitar. The guitar that I'm holding today is our best selling guitar, the Fly Mojo, and the color is Trans Cherry. Now, as many of you know, Parker Guitars was founded in 1993 by Ken Parker and Larry Fishman. His original design concept included the fact that he wanted guitars to be a lot lighter than what they had been until that period of time. As you know, guitars can be quite heavy. Oftentimes they're unbalanced so that when you're in the playing position, the guitar will either dip this way or it'll even come back up on you like that. So Ken wanted a guitar that was lightweight and he also wanted a guitar that was very, very well balanced. In addition, he wanted a guitar that was consistent so that when you tried one guitar and then another, they actually felt and played the same. As opposed to when you go into a store and you try a guitar, it doesn't feel quite right, and then you try another one, it doesn't feel quite right. You might have to try 12, 15, 20 guitars until you find the one that feels exactly right for you, and you're like, wow, that's that's the guitar for me. And that's good, that's part of the fun in, in purchasing guitars, but what it does is it illustrates the inconsistency from one guitar to the next, and the reason for that is the, the materials that the guitars are made out of, as well as the manufacturing process. So what Ken wanted was a guitar that was consistent from one to the next. He also wanted a guitar that had greater tuning stability, he wanted a guitar that had better intonation, and he wanted a guitar that could withstand the temperature and humidity changes that we put our instruments through, so that you wouldn't have to worry about seasonal truss rod adjustments every time the weather or the temperature changed. As he began to design this guitar, what he did is he started with a solid piece of wood here for the body, and if you take a close look here at the back of the guitar, you'll notice that he carved out quite a bit of the wood, and that was to reduce the weight. The neck is also a solid piece of wood, and it's joined to the body using a patented multi-finger joint. This particular part of, of the guitar, for all guitars, is the weakest spot on the guitar and some people actually refer to it as the Bermuda Triangle of sound. But with Ken's patented neck joint here, the way the neck is joined to the body makes a very, very, very strong joint. So there's consistency from this guitar in terms of the resonance or the vibration from the neck all the way through to the body. So again, the neck is also solid wood and depending on the model, it's either going to be basswood, mahogany, it could be maple. And the guitar, because the truss rod is music wire, as opposed to a heavier steel, is very well balanced. You'll notice as I sit it here on my lap, it just sits there in playing positions. It's not dipping down and it's not pulling up on me like this. Now because Ken had removed so much wood from the back of this guitar to make it lightweight, four and a half to five and a half pounds, depending on the model. He also was removing some of the strength of that wood and some of that tone. So to bring strength and tone back into the guitar, what he did is he combined carbon, glass, and epoxy. It's kind of like when we were in elementary school and we combined newspaper, wallpaper paste together to make paper mache. In Ken's case, what he did is he combined carbon, glass, and glue to come up with this new material. And when you watch the video of the factory tour, you'll actually see that material. It's called a carbon, glass, epoxy composite material. It's about the thickness of a business card. And what happens is a layer of it gets applied right here on the back of the neck and another layer gets applied across the whole body. 
the glue itself is heat activated, so when you watch the factory tour, you'll see some ovens. But once it's baked on, it becomes all one piece, and it strengthens the guitar to such a degree that it is no longer susceptible to temperature and humidity changes. So that seasonal truss rod adjustments become virtually unheard of on a Parker guitar. Now there is a truss rod. This is where the truss rod is, in, is uh, found on the Parker guitar. And again we use music wire, otherwise known as piano wire, because it's very, very lightweight. We also use Spurzel locking tuners for a couple of reasons. One, they're American made, but two, they're the best. So for, we use Spurzels for greater tuning stability. The nut here is a self-lubricating Graftec nut. We use stainless steel frets on the guitar. Because as you know, with a regular guitar, frets are made out of a softer material. And the reason they use a softer material is that using anything hard with tangs will actually split the wood, whether it's ebony, rosewood, or maple. If you tap a, a hard steel or, or a hard metal into that wood, it'll actually split the wood. So to overcome that, to use hardened stainless steel, we use an epoxy to apply the fret to the fingerboard. And again, when you see the factory video, you'll see that process actually take place. But soft nickel, when it's uh, used on a regular guitar, you know that those frets will wear out, which will require a fret job. If you can find somebody to do it properly, and secondly, it's expensive. Stainless steel, though, will not wear out. In fact, your fingers will probably wear out before the fret does. For the fingerboard, instead of wood, we use a carbon glass composite material. Again, it's about the thickness of a business card. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, it gives us a platform to apply the stainless steel frets to the, to the guitar. Secondly, unlike wood, it's not going to get sticky. It's not going to gum out, gum up, I should say. It doesn't really require any cleaning, although if you do want to clean it, you use a, 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 just a damp cloth. We do not recommend that you use any um, traditional cleaners or oils on this fingerboard. Wood, over time, can split, and, and we all know what the issues are with wood regarding a fingerboard, but with the carbon glass composite, it's not going to expand and contract like wood will, so you will not get or have the problems with this fingerboard that you will have otherwise with a wooden fingerboard. It also gets faster. As you play it and your fingers begin to perspire, this fingerboard actually gets slicker and allows for faster playing. We use on this particular guitar Seymour Duncan pickups on the Mojo. On other Fly Series guitars we use DiMarzio pickups that are custom wound. This is the JB pickup here in the bridge position and this is the Jazz here in the neck position. We coil tap the pickups so that you can get single coil tones out of these pickups. This is the patented Parker vibrato system. It has a six element piezo system built right into the bridge. This is manufactured by Fishman Transducers and it allows us to provide acoustic tones from this guitar. Now the vibrato system, as I mentioned, is patented. And instead of using the coil type springs that are traditionally found in a guitar, we use a flat spring. And the spring that's in the guitar is equivalent to the gauge strings that are being used on the guitar. In this particular case, we're using nine gauge strings on the guitar, so you'll see that there's a nine gauge plate in the guitar. Now, if you want to change the gauge of strings, all you have to do is loosen this wheel. I refer to it as the flywheel. But you loosen this wheel. That will alleviate some of the tension that's here and allow you to remove this spring. You then will replace the spring with the appropriate one. Let's say, for example, you're putting 10 gauge strings on your guitar. You'll put a 10 plate in here, a 10 spring. Tighten it back up. 
and then you can go ahead and tune your guitar up. Now you may have to tighten this down once or twice after that. But what you don't have to do, like on a traditional guitar, when you change the gauge of strings, what happens is the bridge will pull up on you. So you have to get back in there with a screwdriver and tighten down those screws to bring the bridge back flush to the guitar. And then you have to do that process two, three, four, five times. I'll never forget the first time that I did it. I thought I had completely ruined my guitar. Uh, little did I know that it was okay, but I always thought afterwards that I had done something to screw it up. Now the tremolo, in the position that it's in right now, it's set so that you can bend the tremolo down, and that's all. This little switch right here is called the step stop switch. And in this position, it's preventing this spring from moving forward, but it can move backwards, which means that you can bend down on the tremolo. Now, if you move this switch over this way, this spring is now floating. So that when you have your, your trim arm inserted into the bridge, you can now lift up on the trim arm or you can bend down on the trim arm. So for all intents and purposes, you have a floating tremolo. The other thing that you can do while the guitar is in this setting is take this wheel and give it a couple of turns so you're putting more tension on the step stop switch, which means that it'll be more difficult for you to bend down on the tremolo. And so what you've done basically is put the guitar into a um, stop tail mode. The third thing that you can do with this bridge is leaving it in this position, give this wheel a couple of turns, and what it'll do is put enough pressure on the step stop so that you will not be able to push down on the tremolo very easily. So what you've done is you've made this bridge either a hardtail or fixed position, whichever term that you prefer. So it offers all three positions. It's the only guitar in the world that can do this. So if you prefer bend down only in your playing, you can set it up like that. If you prefer to be in floating mode, you can set it up like that as well. On the other hand, if you don't use the tremolo at all, you can just tighten it and put it into a fixed position or hardtail. For electronics, we feature a volume knob for the pickups. We feature a tone control for the pickups. And the tone control also doubles as a splitter so that you can get single coil tones. This knob here is volume for the piezo system. Now the way it works is this particular switch, in this position, this switch controls your electronics. So in the back position, you're in acoustic only mode. So if you're using the stereo cable that came with the guitar and you're plugged into an acoustic amp or a PA and an electric amp, the output will only be from the piezos and you'll get just acoustic tone. In the forward position, you'll be getting tone from your magnetic pickups. And this is your traditional three-way switch. So if you're in the back position here with the coil tap in or the tone control in, you'll have your bridge humbucker active. If you have this in the center, you'll have both pickups active. If you have it towards the neck, you will have this humbucker active. And then if you coil tap it, you will have a single coil here, the inside coil. If you have it in the center position, you will have your two inside coils. And if you have it in the back position, you will have the inside coil of this humbucker only. Lastly, if you put this switch in the middle, you will have both the piezo and the magnetic pickups active so you can blend acoustic tones with electric guitar tones. Hi, this is John Page with Parker Guitars. Today we're going to take you through a tour of the Parker factory. I am holding in my hands one of our custom pieces, a Fly Artist in a red burst. And today we're going to take you back in the factory and show you how we make these guitars.
Okay, we're back here in the Parker factory, and behind me what you'll see is the wood. This is where the wood is brought in. It's aged for quite a few months. After the wood is aged and it's ready to go, what we do is we put it in that, that planer over there to get the wood to the exact thickness that we want it to be before it gets cut. Okay, once we have the wood to the exact thickness that we want it to be, what we will do is put this plexiglass template on the wood and just with a pencil, just draw the template of the fly guitar right there on the wood. What we will then do is take it over to one of our band saws and we will actually cut out the Parker shape. From there it goes over to the CNC machine, so let's go there now and see what that looks like. When it comes out of the CNC machine, you can see how thick it is. It's actually quite heavy at this particular point in time. This particular piece of wood will become a fly guitar. Over here at the CNC machine is where we do most of the cutting of the wood. And you can see in here the CNC machine, this is a fly guitar and the neck has already been joined to the body and it's going through its final cut. It takes about 12 and a half minutes for it to cut. So we'll just watch the machine work here for a moment or two. Okay, now what we're showing you here is where the neck joins the body of the guitar. At Parker, we use a patented multi-finger joint, and if you look closely, you can see that joint. We can't really show you too, too much of it because of the proprietary nature of that joint. However, we do use a, just a very common wood glue here. The reason for that is when this guitar is baked, this glue will actually soften up. The neck and the body will find exactly where they want to be, and then when it comes out of the oven and cools down, the neck and the body will be joined together solidly. And then what we'll do in our swing department, which we'll show you in just a few moments, is we are going to manipulate the neck so that we get the perfect radius neck. Okay, I'm holding here one of the truss rods that we use on the Parker Fly Guitar. You'll notice that it's very thin, it's very slender. It's also very, very lightweight. And this is actual piano wire or music wire. And the reason we use this is because it's very lightweight. One of Ken's design concepts was that every piece of the Parker guitar had to be as light as possible. What it does also is it makes sure that the guitar is perfectly balanced so that when you're in playing position, you don't have to fight the neck. Now what we do on the fly guitar is we will route out the neck here and insert the truss rod. In this particular neck, the truss rod's already been inserted. Now this is a night fly neck and you can see where it's already been routed for this truss rod to be inserted. And over here, on this neck is what it looks like after the truss rod has been inserted and this has been covered up. Now before we take you over to the composite department to show you how that process is done, we just wanted to show you a few that are works in progress. This is before it gets to the CNC machine, but you can see there's large stacks of guitars. We're trying to produce as many guitars as we can per day while maintaining the quality and the integrity of the Parker line. Okay, so we're back here in the uh, composite room. We're going to talk to you a little bit about the composite materials that we use. Now we use a, a composite material. It's a mix of carbon, glass, and wool. Uh, it's a proprietary process that we use to strengthen the overall guitar, the integrity of the guitar, so that it's not susceptible to, uh, or I should say it's less susceptible to temperature and humidity changes. It assists us with the tuning stability of the guitar, it assists us with intonation, and it assists us with truss rod adjustments. Seasonal truss rod adjustments become virtually unheard of with Parker. So over here is where we keep the composite materials. It's kept in a freezer because the composite material, the glue that's embedded in it, is actually heat activated. So this is what it looks like. It comes to us this particular piece comes to us in the shape of the guitar. 
Now if I were to keep my fingers on here for any amount of time, I'd begin to, to feel the tackiness of the epoxy that is inside them. The other strip that we use, which goes along the neck, looks like this. And so what we'll do now is we'll walk back into the composite area and show you exactly how this process takes place. Now here we have a fly guitar that's in a, uh, that's in a uh, clamping device and it's kept here at about waist level. And what happens is, is a glue will be applied here to the neck. This particular piece of composite material will be applied here where the truss rod is. And then what will happen is the composite material that is in the shape of the guitar will be applied to the entire back of the guitar. It will then uh, be allowed to cure for a bit. And what will happen after that is it'll be wrapped up in these materials right here. It's a cotton-like material that resists glue sticking to it. And here's a closer shot of that material right here. This is the cotton-like material and this is a little bit softer and smoother. Once it's wrapped up into this material, it'll be placed into a heat-resistant plastic bag and it will be hermetically sealed. In other words, all the air should be vacuum sealed. So all the air will be uh, sucked out of that bag and then from that point forward it'll be placed in an oven. To 350 degrees, and the guitars are placed in here for approximately two and a half hours. We do both the necks and the guitars here, and again, they're in there for about two and a half hours. Now, when they come out, we let them cool. They take quite a while to cool, and once they come out of the bags, uh, then they have to be removed from that material and they have to be all cleaned up. You can see in this oven as well that we can also bake guitars in this oven. This is actually a pizza oven. So if you can believe that, it's more like a restaurant. We've got pizza ovens and we have freezers. Okay, now once it comes out of the oven and it's taken out of that plastic bag, it's actually pretty messy looking. But once it gets cleaned up, this is what it's going to look like. Now here's the back of the body and you can see the carbon glass material now has been bonded completely to the back of the guitar. If you look closely, you can see just how thin that material really is. So again, it went from this state of being frozen to now it is a completely part of that guitar. As you can see, there's quite a bit of handwork that goes into making one of these guitars. So we're not pumping hundreds of guitars off the production line every single day like other guitar companies do. In this particular case, there's a tremendous amount of craftsmanship and handwork that needs to be done. Okay, so we are now going to show you the Parker fingerboard and our swing machine process. But before that, I just want to show you our fret. This is a stainless steel fret. It's tangless, so you'll notice on the back of it, it's quite flat, and it's also pretty rough. And the reason for that is we use an epoxy to bond the fret to the fingerboard, so it needs to be flat and rough. 
This here is the Parker fingerboard. You can take a look at how thin it is. This again is a carbon glass composite material. We actually make these fingerboards here and they're pressed in that pink contraption over there. Now, that's surrounded because about Parker that people don't usually take notice of is that not only do we build great guitars but a lot of the tooling that you are seeing here today was actually designed and built by Parker Guitars and the process that I'm going to show you next I believe is really the magic behind Parker it goes directly to the playability and the consistency of the Parker guitar now I want you to notice with this fret how perfectly oval it is now it's a perfect oval so that when you're playing, you cannot fret out. The string will always hit the center point of the fret each and every single time. Now before we show you the uh, swing machine, which is another tool that Ken Parker designed and, and made, I just want to talk about the Parker fingerboard for a moment. The Parker fingerboard is a conical radius fingerboard. Now most guitar manufacturers use what's referred to as a compound radius neck. And what is a compound radius? Well a radius is a straight line, so a compound radius must be a double straight line. But what exactly does that mean? And what does a conical radius mean? But what other manufacturers are trying to convey to you is that their radius is the cross section of a cylinder. Cross section of a straight cylinder. So in other words, if you take a tube and cut it in half and then put a board on top of it, that would be representative of their fingerboard. And this is one of the reasons why guitar players will have issues with playing up here in the upper reaches of the fingerboard. As a matter of fact, most bolt-on neck guitars have a square joint right here. And because this is the weakest spot in the whole guitar, when the strings are on it, you're going to have the strings pulling this way and the truss rod pulling back the other way. And this straight neck joint basically will act as a hinge. So it's going to go back and forth like this. So over time, you're going to have what some people refer to as the 12th fret ski jump or humping at the neck. Now with the Parker, because of our patented multi-finger joint and the carbon glass reinforcement, that will not occur on this guitar. But getting back to the radius, you will notice here that it's much wider down here in the bottom than it is up here at the top. Now the reason for that is we use that conical radius I referred to. That is a cross section of a cone. So if you think of a, of a traffic pylon, that cone, and you take that and cut it in half and then put a board or a straight line edge on top of it, you will have the Parker fingerboard. And that's why the playability of the fingerboard is consistent from the first fret to the 24th fret. So let's go over to the swing machine and I'll show you how we get the perfect radius neck every single time. We're over here at the swing machine. This particular section of Parker, I believe, is where almost all of the magic of Parker takes place. And this machine was designed and made by Parker Guitars. Basically what we're going to do is take the Parker guitar and put it into this jig. Once we get it locked in, and we won't show you the whole process here, but once we get it locked in, 
what we will do is take this device. It's a clamping type of device that will attach back here. And this particular, you notice it mirrors the headstock. So it'll sit right down here in the headstock. It has six individual strings. It has tuning pegs. And it has an electronic tuner. And what we will do is take this device and affix it to the guitar. We will then actually tune the guitar up to pitch. So what we're going to do is put the tension on the guitar here that will be there when it's a completed guitar. There's not a single other guitar manufacturer in the world that does this process. So we're pulling up on the neck, creating a curvature. And then what we'll do is take this dial and right here, underneath the fifth fret, we will begin to push back up onto this neck. And there's an actual meter here that will measure here the exact amount of relief so that when we achieve the relief that we want, we will lock this whole thing into place, we will remove this fixture from the guitar, and then what we will do is we will actually swing this guitar against the belt sander. By doing this, we will achieve the perfect radius neck every single guitar that we make. And that's why if you were to try a Parker guitar, say in New York City, and then fly out to Los Angeles and try one, they're going to feel and play exactly identical. Now here we have a fingerboard that has had the frets applied to it and it's actually in the process of drying. Once this drying process is complete, it'll be taken over to a carbide cutter, a very special tool that we have to trim these frets down so that they're nice and smooth. Once that is complete, we will then apply this fingerboard to the neck of the guitar We'll put it back into this device, pull that clamp down, turning the platen on again, it heats up to 250 degrees, we we'll put it in for approximately 20 minutes, that's what will activate the epoxy on the fingerboard and that's what attaches the fingerboard to the neck of the guitar. Now remember, this process takes place after we sand down the neck and have the radius exactly the way that we want it. Okay, so over here in this department is where we're going to apply the actual headstock logo to the guitar. Now over here, what you'll see are these brown devices with clamps. Those are called platens. Now once the headstock logo is applied to the guitar, it'll be placed in that device. It heats up to about 200, 250 degrees, and that's how the headstock is applied to the guitar. Over here you'll see these gentlemen working on some necks after the uh, logo headstock is, is applied. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of handwork that has to be done to clean it up and we can watch them work for a few seconds. Okay, once the headstock is complete, the guitars are taken over to be sanded and then painted. Okay, now over here we have our sanding department, where after the uh, composite materials are applied, after the fretboard is applied to the guitar, they come over for a, for a final sand. Well, it's not the final sand, we sand about six dozen times, but this is what the guitar will look like once it's been out of this process, or once it comes out of this department. You can see the back is getting clean, the front of the guitar is looking really nice, it's taped up so it can go into paint. Now the purpose here of showing you this is to show you how labor intensive these guitars are and exactly how much handwork and detail is actually done.
Okay, once they're done with the sanding department, they're placed on this rack. You can see quite a few of them are getting ready to move over into the paint department, which is where we're going to go to. Okay, this guitar that you're looking at right now is a Fly Deluxe in Ice Blue Burst. Now, it came out of the paint department recently, and it needs clear coat and a couple of other items. But we just wanted to show you what it's going to look like once it comes out of the, uh, the actual paint booth. So we're going to head into the paint booth right now. And as we're heading over, you can see some guitars that have come out of paint here recently. Okay, so we're in the actual paint booth of Parker. This is a Fly Deluxe in Magic Blue that's being painted. This is Sharon, our famous painter, who's more of an artist than an actual painter. But as these layers of blue are being applied, what will happen in the drying process is that the guitar will be placed on a spinner before it gets its clear coat and the, and the final. And you can see this guitar here is being placed on the spinner as we uh, shoot here. And we've got eight guitars here spinning. And over here we'll see we've got about seven more. Those are all Nightfly guitars, whereas hanging on the spinners are Fly guitars. A lot of what we do here at Parker Guitars is proprietary, so while we're happy to show you some of the painting process, unfortunately we can't show all of it to you. But here's a Black Cherry Burst Mojo that's come out of the paint booth recently. And you'll notice in the background one of our booths. This is actually where we'll cure the guitars after they get painted. It's heat and humidity controlled, so they will stay there in for a period of time to let the paint dry and cure. And then from there, they will head over into our wet polish area and then from there into final assembly. So let's go. So this is the wet sand area and final polish. And here what you'll see is a pretty nice long line of our new single cut guitar that came out in January of 2005. Over here you'll see a line of fly guitars with the exception of this one which is a single cut. But after the paint department, they'll come over here at this table where they're wet sanded. And then over here, these are our buffers where after they get wet sanded, they're actually going to get buffed and polished. Now from here in this department, what we're going to do is take the guitar over to another CNC machine. And you'll notice on these fly guitars that the cavities for the, for the uh, pickups have not been cut yet. And we are the only company guitar company that we're aware of that actually cuts these pockets out after the guitar has been painted. But we just simply believe that you get a better looking finish by doing that. Okay, now this is the CNC machine where we do the cutting for the electronics. So at, at this process we're going to cut, cut the uh, the layout for the pickups and so on and so forth and then from here it's going to go over to our electronics department which we'll walk over to now this department is where all of the electronics are installed you can take a look at the different pieces that are used here this is a Fly Mojo in Trans Cherry. You can see that the bridge has been installed. Pickups and knob control layout will come next as well as the rest of the electronics. We'll take a look over here at this gentleman who's installing some electronics right now. This looks to be a Fly Supreme guitar. Actually, this is a nylon fly guitar. Okay, so now we're in the uh, final assembly room where the tuners and, and various controls are put on. This is for the most part the last step for the Parker guitar. In here, after uh, the setup, the strings will be put on, it'll be tuned, it'll be intonated, and it'll also be tested. We've got a couple of small amps in here where we can ensure that the uh, piezo system and the magnetic system are both working. You get a uh, visual of the hand work, you know? It's kind of 
set up the intonation a little bit here. Um, get it in the ballpark before I string it up and then I'll um, final intonate it, I guess you might say, uh, once the strings are on it and I'll have it plugged into the tuner. <laughs> okay, so in this particular area, this is where they'll do the uh, really the final polish, and, and you'll see here that they're cleaning the guitar up, getting the tape removed from when it came out of um, out of paint and from that last CNC machine. From here is when it's going to go into setup, final setup, and actually into final assembly, where the electronics are installed, and then to final setup. And it'll actually come back here for one last final polish. And once the guitar is complete, it's going to look something like this. Now we've had this one out here for a couple seconds, so it's gotten a little bit dusty. However, this is a Fly Mojo Flame in Trans Blue. Fly Mojo Flame in Trans Blue. So that pretty much completes the tour of the Parker factory. Uh, there's a whole lot more that we'd like to show you, but again, because of some of the proprietary and patented processes that we use, we're just not able to show you. But we do certainly hope that it provided a, kind of an eye-opening experience, that you've learned a lot more about Parker Guitars. And if you have any questions, visit the Parker Guitars forum at parkerguitars.com slash forum, or visit a Parker dealer near you. Thank you. Okay, this is John Page with Parker Guitars. We are in the sound room of U.S. Music. I'm joined by my friend Matt Cantlin, who's going to help us today demonstrate the, the variety of tones and the versatility of the Parker Fly guitar. He has today a custom piece. This is the Fly Artist in a Red Burst. So you'll be seeing this in, in one of our dealer's locations pretty soon. For uh, gear today, what we're using is we're using a Randall RG75 G2 series. It's a 75 watt guitar combo. On the clean channel, we have the level set at about the 9 o'clock position. We have very, very little reverb here. It's a dry signal that we're using. We have the treble, the mids, and the bass actually set right in the middle. Now on the second channel, we've got um, a little bit of gain dialed in. We've got the treble at about the uh, 2, 3 o'clock position. Mids that are about the 11 o'clock position. Bass is uh, just about center. And, uh, and then we've got a little bit more gain dialed in for channel 3. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out on a clean uh, tone. We're going to use the two inside coils of the guitar with the tone knob pulled out. So it's coil tapped. And this is a great tone, nice, clean rhythm tone. Okay, next what we're going to do is we're going to flip the uh, selector switch up so that we are using the single coil neck. Now I want you to notice that this particular uh, selector switch we have in the forward position, this is what controls the electronics. So right now in the forward position we're using just the magnetic pickups. If we were to put this in the back position it would be piezo only and if we had it in the center it would be the both of them combined. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go over to channel 2 to a dirtier sound. We've got the single coil in the neck. <laughs> Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to push the tone control in. So we go to the humbucker, we're going to use the bridge humbucker in this setting. We're going to go to channel 3 for real over the top heavy gain sound. <laughs> I just did on that is I flipped the switch over to an acoustic guitar. With this guitar you can actually go to an acoustic sound and we'll let Matt play here for a second so you can hear what the acoustic sound is like. Now if you're a guitar player in a band you're the only guitar player in the band you can actually combine these two tones together by putting this in the middle or turn the gain down, uh, the volume down a little bit on the magnetic.
darker guitar is that by using your dynamics, if you play harder, you'll actually hear more of the piezo, whereas if you play softer, you'll actually hear more of the electric. So what we'll do now is we will go up here to the neck humbucker. We're going to dial the tone almost all the way down. And we're going to go back to a nice clean tone over here on this Randall. And uh, we'll, we'll get to hear a nice warm jazz sound. And a lot of people don't think of Parker, I know I never did, as a jazz guitar. But the fact is it's so resonant, you know, like an old jazz box. Uh, but you can hear the nice dark jazz tone that comes out of it. Now what I just did there is while Matt was playing, I dialed in some of the acoustic tone so that you can hear it. Because the Parker is a solid body, not a hollow body guitar like an old jazz box. What happens is it doesn't have that uh, that woody acoustic sound to it. But by dialing in some of the piezo, this is with without piezo. This is with the piezo. You get some of that woodiness of an old of an old uh, hollow body jazz box. Okay, now the next tone that we'll do is we will bring the uh, tone back up. We'll go here to the uh, bridge position. We'll pull the coil tap to. Uh, to make it single coil, we're going to give the uh, amp oh, just a little bit more reverb and a little bit more treble. And from here, you can get you know some Telecaster type of tones. Now, at this point, if you were to bring the piezo back in, you're going to get a Telecaster tone. Okay, we're back on the high gain setting, which is channel three of this Randall. We're back in the bridge humbucker, and this particular gu guitar, the Fly Mojo, just really screams. This is where this guitar really comes to life, is in this setting. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to show you now uh, perhaps the best clean tone that you'll ever hear. So it's the two inside coils of this guitar uh, going through this Randall combined with the piezo system, the acoustic guitar. By the way, uh, today as a, an acoustic amp, we're actually using a bass guitar amplifier by our sister company Eden. This is the Eden uh, Nemesis 120 watt EFT bass guitar amplifier. And uh, so again, clean tone here and acoustic tone here. Mm -hmm. 